Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via YouTube, Stitcher and Apple Podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swaddling, the co-founder of Croydon Constitutionalist. Mike, what have we got to discuss today? Hello Dan. So today we're talking uh, very much about Brexit, a uh, big focus given the, the recent events. Uh, the latest on the withdrawal agreement, some more news from Project Cheer, recent street stalls we've held in Croydon in Addiscombe and Thornton Heath, we've got an interview with local Brexiteer and Libertarian Party member Rhys Furlance and talking about some of the upcoming Brexit events in Croydon and London. Thanks. So Brexit... The withdrawal agreement has now been agreed in principle by the 27 heads of state of the EU. Uh, they may have agreed it in about 40 minutes. It's going to take a damn sight more than 40 minutes for it to get agreed by Parliament, if indeed it ever does get agreed. We have, I believe, now some 100 Conservative members of Parliament who have said that they will not be supporting the agreement um, when it comes before the House of Commons. Whether or not that means they're going to vote against it, we don't yet know. Um, the Labour Party says they're going to vote against it, and Lib Dems even, SNP even. Um, Mike, does this have any chance whatsoever of passing? I, I only, I only way I can see this passing is if uh, the Labour Party, the, as being the main ones, uh, turn and support the government. And, and I was interviewed just recently on Radio Sputnik about this, and that's up on our website uh, for those interested. Uh, and, and it really is... A, the only way this happens is if the Conservatives use Labour votes to get this through and the Conservatives fully, finally admit, May government, May's government admits that they are no longer in power, they are merely in office. Uh, that would have disastrous consequences for that party, but that would might be... Disastrous consequences appears to be uh, Theresa May's uh, current modus operandi. I mean, Theresa May doesn't seem to want to listen to to anybody who says anything that she disagrees with or that Ollie Robbins disagrees with. She seems to have done every single thing the European Union could have possibly asked of her and more because I almost think the European Union could not have asked for more. I, I don't think they would have asked for half the, the things in this agreement. Um, she seems incapable of persuading her own her own MPs to actually buy into it. Now, that doesn't mean that many of them won't vote for it because, you know, if you if you stay within the government, certainly you do need to vote for it. And there's the best part of 100 MPs who form the government. They're not in the cabinet necessarily, but they, they have some sort of ministerial position. So they're going to have to vote for it. So she's probably got about 100 votes. But I don't know that she's got that many more. There's probably one random Lib Dem will vote for it and a, a, I don't know, Green Party or something maybe. But, I mean, who knows? It, it's not looking good for her. When, when uh, uh, John Major referred to those bastards that caused him a, a load of trouble over Europe, I think you were talking about a dozen MPs or so. Theresa May has 300-ish Conservative MPs. As you say, a hundred of them are in the government. They're on the they're on the payroll. They have to vote for her. Of the two hundred MPs left, half of them have now publicly come out and said they won't vote for her withdrawal agreement. This is spectacularly bad management by her of her party. I mean, it's I can't think of a precedent anything like that where the major piece of government legislation of the. 200 people that could vote against it within the party, half of them have come out against it. I can't think of anything even close. There was, there were some quite big rebellions under Tony Blair. Now, I had a huge majority. wasn't an issue. John Major had some rebellions. I believe the DUP even voted for some of Callaghan stuff when he was in power because the likes of Neil Kinnock were rebelling at the time. But these are handfuls of MPs. This is 100 people in the governing party saying no. It is... Let's say I think it's unprecedented. Um, it, it shows a colossal lack of management by uh, the Theresa May and her chief of staff. Uh, clearly uh, seem to be hell-bent on, on taking their party apart. They do. I mean, you know, politicians, they generally know, what, know how to be a politician. They may do things we don't like, but they're usually politically savvy at least. 
this doesn't seem to be that way. Uh, she just seems hell bent on on you know, destroying her own party, no, no matter what. Um, like you said, there's been no precedence of this. I think that's right. In well, ever since everybody over the age of twenty one had the vote, um, I think even since you know every adult male has had the vote. The only thing I can think of in the days of even vague democracy uh, was the repeal of the Corn Laws. That's the that's the only thing I can really think of. Um, there was some similarish cases, maybe not not of this size, even to do with the um, the Irish Home Rule yeah. bills. But I mean, it's it's yeah, the size of it. If if Labour were to to back this deal and, and, and get it through, that that would be the way she gets it through. Absolutely, completely unprecedented in, in in well since the well since the First World War at least. And the repeal of the Corn Laws fundamentally changed the party structures in this country. Um, I I'm very reluctant to record to to think that this might do that again since since there's probably only been two changes in party structures in this country's entire democratic history, which came about from the repeal of the Corn Laws and then came about through the emergence of the Labour Party. Uh, perhaps one is actually even linked to the other, um, but but in terms of precedence, this is has it, 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 it only achieves the precedence of those events, um, and so who knows what the outcome of that will be. So Theresa May's way, it seems, a strategy for getting this through, um, apart from doing dodgy um, backroom deals or what have you, and possibly offering knighthoods to certain people seems to have been to go out to the country uh, where their MPs aren't and to, and to talk to the people and to try to get them to persuade their MPs to, to vote for it. Um, while she's out and about doing this, we've had what can only be described as, you know, it's not Project Fear Mark 2 or Mark 3, it's Project Hysteria. Uh, we've gone from suggestions of there being uh, queues at Dover and Calais through to, you know, your house is going to drop in value by a third, unemployment's going to shoot up by this, that and the other. It, it, and people don't seem to think that it's credible. <coughs> Mike, how do you feel? Have you been going hysterical this week? Well, I, I, I've firmly been believing that the end of the world is here. I've, I've uh, brought huge amounts of spam. I've dug a big uh, bunker in the back. No, of course not. Um, it, what struck me in the last week, and obviously knowing our involvement in this, people speak to you, it's it's the element of people that don't normally talk to me about politics calling the Bank of England utter nonsense, saying just how ridiculous these things are, these these predictions they're coming out with. Carney is has become the thing you never want to be, someone people laugh at. You know, he's just such a joke. Um the the Bank of England is no longer a credible organisation. They they missed the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, they completely lied in the run-up to the referendum under Carney. Um, and they have now come out with utter nonsense again uh, as a result of the potential for a no-deal. It, it's a politically motivated um, set of proposals, uh, thoughts, plans, uh, and it, it's... I can only think that in the future, someone is going to... Whoever, once we've left the EU, the people in, in the Bank of England, the, the top three or four tiers of that organisation needs to be cleared out en masse if it's ever to have any credibility again. Certainly. And, and the, the Treasury, the, the forecasts they've come out with are all worst-case scenarios and they, they do not take into account anything to do with growth outside of the EU, any trade deals we might be able to do, uh, just general trade with, with countries outside of the EU, which, of course, for the most part, um, are growing far faster than the, the, the remainder of the EU. Um, so they're just, like you say, there's just the, it literally incredible forecasts and with all that was said before the referendum, you know, unemployment shooting up by this, interest rates going up, interest rates will go up. What happened the day after the referendum? Mark Carney, who said, oh, there's no plan for a, a leave vote, turned out and immediately cut the interest rates. He has that power to do that. You know, there are things that can be done. It, and if, you, if we, you know, went for don't, no deal now, 
you might have to make that decision, then you can you can put certain things in place which will alleviate any of the problems that may occur on March the 30th. But again, that's only in the worst case scenario of uh, tariffs being applied. And that's absolutely no need for tariffs to be applied whatsoever. We can continue to trade with people uh, from within the EU when we're outside the EU. We just have the ability to do our own trade deals and set our own regulations. Um, But don't worry, Mike. Nothing to fear about this because it's all going to get sorted in a proposed television debate between Theresa May and... Jeremy Corbyn. Remain. Sort of. Yeah, um, the, the date doesn't seem to have been set yet, but um, or indeed the television channel, because there seems to be some arguments about that. But as you say, it's uh, both of them campaigned for Remain. Theresa May then said she was in favour of Brexit because it's what the people had voted for, and, you know, Brexit means Brexit, etc., Jeremy Corbyn was a lifelong Brexiteer before the term Brexiteer had even been coined. And then when he became Labour Party leader and the referendum was called, decided, well, he probably better back Remain. Um, But yeah, you're now going to have a television debate where they're going to argue about a deal which is not leave or it's mostly Remain. Uh, It just seems baffling. Uh, Will you be tuning in? No. No. Um, I cannot, for the life of me, think of anything else worse to watch. Um, If you had an actual lever on there against Theresa May, the very simple question that says, can we unilaterally withdraw from this agreement? She can't answer, because we can't unilaterally withdraw from this agreement. Can we make our own trade deals whilst we're in this agreement? She can't answer, because we can't make our own trade deals whilst we're in this agreement. Will we be free from jurisdiction of the ECJ? She won't be able to answer. All those questions that any lever could answer, ask her, and leave her stumbling and fumbling and and and, and playing for time. Jeremy Corbyn's not going to ask those questions. Jeremy Corbyn's not capable of asking those questions. Jeremy Corbyn and Labour Party policy, or lack of it, is not capable of allowing him to ask those questions. So this... A true exercise in futility. I will find many, many better things to do on the night that this is uh, shown, whenever that might be. Um, and and I don't know, you know, paint drying, flies on a wall, um, or or just sitting in a darkened room with all the lights off have got to be better choices than than the world's most pointless TV debate. Agreed. I, I, I don't think it's going to get uh, much in the way of viewing figures. I think there's talk of it being on a, on a Sunday evening, um, but the, they can't decide whether it should be a, on after Strictly Come Dancing results or the, uh, the X Factor results or something like that, I believe. It depends upon which channel it's on. So I'm sure people will, uh, will nonetheless stay tuned. Yeah. Uh, OK, so that's where we are with the withdrawal agreement. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next, in the next couple of weeks. But, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, as we we like to say on the podcast. We've got another Project Cheer story to discuss. Uh, The China Sovereign Wealth Fund and HSBC are in talks to launch a fund of up to £1 billion to invest in British companies. And this is likely to be announced next year, funnily enough, when we leave the European Union. HSB said in a statement that the Chinese fund, the Chinese Investment Corporation, is exclusively working with them and a, pri- and a British private equity firm to create a fund to invest in high-quality and growing UK companies with development opportunities in China. Mike, more investment in this country. What's going on? It's almost like everyone around the world with any economic background, and I mean uh, background in business in actually making money. I don't mean economists. They, they've never done an honest day's work in their life. Uh, I mean the people that actually make money is putting their faith in Britain. Uh, Lo and behold, if only our own government, if only our own opposition MPs, if only our own media, and if only the EU-funded CBI would put as much faith in Britain as the big economic global players are. Uh, We keep getting this good news. They see a great future for us. Uh, It's just whether we can get our sodding politicians out of the way and get there. Exactly. Exactly. Common sense says that Britain is a great place to do business and will continue to be a great place to do business. 
whatever our trading situation is with the EU, no doubt we can have a free trade agreement with them. But if we're going to be entangled with this backstop and customs union and what have you, that's going to limit our ability to drop tariffs um, with these with these other nations, which is what we want to do. We want to do real free trade. And unfortunately, the withdrawal agreement will curtail us from doing that, uh, especially with other countries. So project cheer, great news there for the British economy. Um, finally on Brexit for now, um, we've done some recent street stalls in Addiscombe and Thornton Heath. Mike, how did they go? Uh, two great events, really. Uh, both both a lot of fun. Good to get the old gang back together. And uh, we had some help from uh, some of our friends in the countryside. Um, Anniscombe, uh, always a fun place for us. We've, we've done a podcast talking about uh, some of the events uh, that went on last summer in Anniscombe during the referendum campaign. Large turnout of our people. Lots of support locally. French journalists uh, interviewing us for the radio. And, and a, an overwhelming message from people, they just want to get on with it and get it done. They want Brexit. They don't want this... this they certainly don't want a people's vote, or a second referendum, let's, let's call it by what it is. And they don't trust Theresa May, and that came out and out and out. There's uh, The only support they have left is the fear of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, if the Labour Party ever got their act together by having a socialist, but someone who's not quite as endemically a link to terrorists as Jeremy, they would crush the Conservatives in the polls, would be my impression there. And Addiscombe's the, the middle of the middle of the middle in Croydon. Um, Thornton Heath was, a, 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 again, a, a good place. Um, Thornton Heath, not the most obvious uh, Brexit territory, although Croydon North voted 40% to leave. Um, again, lots of support, lots of people that want us to get on with it. Um, a real kind of belief in the future up there when you speak to people once once we get out um bit of an interesting running with some local labor party activists who who seem to think they could uh, somehow intimidate us into not being there fun and games not not really had that from anyone from any party before so it's disappointing they feel to uh not enact the kind of gentler politics that jeremy corbyn once talks about um, but, yeah, again, uh, another good good street stall out there. I think we're likely to close down for the cold season now for a bit, but um, assuming we need to, getting out, getting on the streets, speaking to people, handing out leaflets, really is a great way of engaging the public. And I'd encourage anyone that hasn't done it before to uh, come along and help us on one of our street stalls. Oh, definitely. Uh, as you say, that the turnout was good at, at both stalls. Um, you mentioned the, that people want the government to get on with it. That's absolutely the case. And Theresa May has been claiming that that's the message that she has been getting around the country. Yet, Theresa, I don't think you're listening properly. They mean get on with it. You've had two and a half years to do this. Sort it out. They don't mean get... Please, members of parliament, vote for this lovely deal that Theresa has put together. They mean you should have got on with it. That's definitely the message. Mm. People know that this deal is not good enough. They know it's not what they voted for, and they do not want it. And that message was coming across loud and clear at, at, at both of those at both of those stalls. And um, obviously, Addiscombe, this as I think I described in the the video that I that I did for on the occasion, it's the swingiest ward in one of the swingiest seats in the country. Um, and yes, it, what people could be supporting the Labour Party or the Conservative Party traditionally, but people from both sides of the, uh, the political spectrum, if you like, nonetheless all agree that Brexit is the way ahead and that the, uh, the, the people's vote that we had on the 23rd of June, uh, the result of that should be, should be enacted. Thornton Heath, different area to Addiscombe, uh, much more um, diverse population. Uh, lots of people from the Caribbean, lots of people from the Indian subcontinent. Um, and we had great support from people from those communities. Um, so, yeah, there's people from all over Croydon, from all kinds of different backgrounds, who just want to get out of the EU. They voted to leave the EU and they expect the government to get on with it. And it was really clear in Thornton Heath, Steve, Steve Reid, the MP for Croydon North, had come out uh, in the few days before our streets saw up there in favour of the second referendum. This is a disgusting move that would uh, be an end to our democracy. Steve is very comfortable enjoying democracy when he wins. 
his side lost, and, and I know this personally, that, that, you know, when you lose, Steve's very magnanimous, because I've walked up to him, having lost to him, and shaken his hand and, and offered him the best. It's just a shame he doesn't feel the ability to do the same with the biggest vote in British hi- history. There was no one in thought and Heath after another referendum. They get that we voted. They get that we need to now get on with leaving. And, uh, yeah, really shabby politics from Steve Reid right now. Absolutely. And, and like you say, the, um, the Labour lot that turned up, they didn't turn up. To, to engage with us at all they were just going out um, canvassing but they, they stumbled across us and were particularly unpleasant uh, when they did so completely unnecessarily uh, trying to disrupt us but and I have to say just, uh, just for anyone that's never done this yeah. typically when you have uh, someone from another party or from a, a, a different like the Remain campaign during the referendum it, you're almost over friendly with each other it's always very nice very pleasant uh, you make a point of saying hello to each other. Uh, certainly been swapped stories in pubs afterwards when we've been out on street stalls with people. It's normally very good. And yeah, and, you know, let's say uh, a, a, a tide that has turned among some members of Croydon North Labour. Indeed, indeed. Well, that's enough for uh, exclusive discussion of, of Brexit for, for now. Uh, what we've got coming up now is an interview that we did uh, recently with a local Brexiteer and Libertarian Party member, Rhys Furlance. Hello, I'm Mike Swaddling, here with Dan Heaton for our second Croydon Constitutionalist interview with our special guest, Rhys. Rhys is a South London lad, a Brexiteer and a Libertarian who worked with us on the Brexit campaign here in Croydon. Uh, so Rhys, we first met on the Brexit campaign here in Croydon, as I say, Although you worked across a few boroughs, I believe, uh, I, I believe as part of it. What are your recollections from the referendum campaign round here? Oh, we're, go, oh, we're going back two years now. Um, I remember it being quite a heated atmosphere, but heated in a good way. Um, so um, a lot of conversation about things such as political union, ever closer union, immigration, free trade, um, open borders... And I found it quite heated, but in a good way. I found it very enjoyable as well to be part of the Brexit experience and, you know, being part of, I guess, being part of the, the people that have led to our country being free from the EU, or tr- at least trying to be. I, I, feel, I feel quite privileged in a way. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a great experience and it was, um, yeah, it was heated at times, but overall it was, it was, it was a pretty enjoyable one, very, very good. So Dan, Dan fronted one of the meetings, or in fact all of our meetings, our public meetings, and one here in Addiscombe, which you spoke at. Um, now it was just up the road at Clyde Hall. Mm. And uh, was that the first time you'd done any public speaking? And have, have you done it before or since? How did, how did you find doing that? Um, it was the first time I've sort of done public speaking in sort of political sense. I mean, obviously I've done a few sort of speeches at uni and stuff, but it was more related to what I was studying as opposed to sort of politics. Um, it was. I found it. I found it really good to speak to a bunch of people about you know why I think we should leave the EU. And the issue I spoke about was immigration. And um, you know, it's really it's really funny. I guess being um, I, mean, I don't want to bring identity politi- politics into this. I hate doing it. But I, you know, I guess you know I'm black, so it's, and I'm a Brexiteer, so you come. I, talk, I was speaking about immigration, and you know, I guess as um. As a young black lad, you know, from the you know parent, you know, from background is a you know parents from the Caribbean, etc. I guess you always sort of feel. I guess at points I thought, you know, are people actually gonna sort of listen to what I'm saying? So I thought some people think, well, hold on, you know, he's black, he can't have a, an, an opinion on immigration, for example. His parents are from an immigrant background, so I, that was my biggest worry, especially being in a London audience. Um, um, but overall, I found I found the speaking quite enjoyable, and I would honestly say to anyone, you know, whatever your political beliefs are, you know, whether against mine, if you have believed in something, speak about it. You know, go out and speak about it. You know, it gives you so much confidence as well, um, uh, and it makes you think a lot about your own views as well. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, and I think the audience enjoyed it as well. Um, yeah, I thought it was quite good. And I, I know that was the first time I'd put on any. Uh uh, public meetings and I, I couldn't 
believe actually how relatively easy it was. Uh, I don't know, Dan. We we done a lot of work there. I don't think either of us had really ever done anything like that before. But 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 book a hall costs hundred quid. Mm. Actually, quite hard to book. Uh, surprisingly, deliver a few thousand leaflets to get people along is quite hard. But but then they just come. I I, I was I was shocked and amazed when we started doing it. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Um... I mean, we didn't know what to expect with the first meeting that we held, which was in Kenley, and we must have got the best part of 100 people turn up. Um, I think by the, the Clyde Hall one, and, and, and we, we held a subsequent meeting not very far from Clyde Hall, in a, another part of Croydon quite close by, um, and we must have got 50 to 60 people at both of those events. So people were very much engaged with the, with the referendum campaign, um, and I think once we'd, we'd got into the swing of things, it was you know, we knew what we were doing, uh, whereas, uh, whereas uh, Reese, he obviously had sort of dropped in on this particular particular meeting. It was the first one that he did for us. We'd had done a couple, I think, by this point. Uh, but yeah, he fitted in well and, and did the job. It was uh, it was great. Yeah, um, like I, I was actually surprised how much people actually came. I thought, you know, I thought you know it's just South London that people really be interested in politics. I thought maybe about a few people come, maybe maybe five or ten people, but. When the turnout, I thought was pretty good, and it was good that people were engaging with the arguments. And um, they say, "Oh, the people didn't know what they voted for." They bloody well did. They came out, they listened to arguments, they they listened to both argument sides being contested. So they they knew what they were they knew what they were voting for. They definitely did. I absolutely agree. And now you, you mentioned the identity politics, and I think I, I agree. It's uh, your identity should be what you do, not not how you were born. Mm. Frankly. Um, uh, but I, I did notice as, as the referendum went on, we we gained more of and and something we didn't necessarily identify early on. I think it was a bit of a failing, I'd say myself in Croydon as sort of leading the borough vote, but a lot of us, the Commonwealth vote coming to us, mm. and and we got that sense of people um, uh, of, of a Commonwealth background getting more and more positive for the leave vote and and we really noticed that it kind of leads me on to i heard a bit of a story about an eventful street store you had in brixton uh, uh and obviously a, a, yeah. a, a very uh, <laughs> ethnically diverse area mm. where some threats were made and you were rather amusingly called a, a racist yeah um <laughs> and i called a ra- absolutely i was called a called a racist and um it's it's funny actually because um it's happened it happened on i think Many different occasions, actually. I, I was I was called a racist. So there was one situation where I think it was in the morning on a Saturday. I was with um, um, Rob, um Robert Anderson, the um, UKIP leader in um in Brooks, um, um, Lambeth. We were doing a stall, and um, there was another stall, like not too far from us. I think they were a sort of socialist, communist sort of stall, you know. But my view, but I believe in free speech. I I believe communism is one of the most evil ideologies in the world. But people want to discuss it, you know, feel free. And um, I thought they'll they'll leave us alone because. I actually got some communists that I know that actually support Brexit, which is quite funny. Um, and then they were speaking about, I think, oh, the rich and the banks. And then one of them, ter- one of them turned to me and said, "And you, how can you of all people be supporting Brexit?" And I said, "Sorry, mate, what do you mean, me of all people?" And um, he said something along the lines about, you know, you're black. And I was like, I, "Why the hell does that matter? Like Brexit was not, not. It's not about colour. It's not about." It's about whether you believe the UK should be a member of a political union, whether you believe in the sovereignty of the United Kingdom. Now, you may well be black and believe that um, the UK should be sovereign. You may well be black and think the UK should be a member of the EU. That's fine. But why would you equate someone's views to, oh, you're black, so you can't believe in Brexit? Another time as well, I was handing out leaflets. Um, one guy said to me, um, wait, are you actually black? And I said to him, oh, mate, that really is not a clever thing to say. Uh, another time, um, someone said said to me, "You know, your parents should be ashamed." And it made me realise how at least I'm going to step away from Brexit for a little bit. It made me realise how crazy we've got in this country of identity politics. I discussed it with my friend earlier. The problem with the UK and the US is that if you're black, you're meant to be a left wing voter. You're meant to be even left wing views. You can't believe in your, like, the Brexit. They, they equate it with oh, colonialism and you know slavery. So how can you, Reese, someone from the Caribbean, support Brexit? But you know what? It's because I don't believe in the un- EU as a political union. That's why. And many people from the Commonwealth believe the same thing. Give me one example. When it comes to immigration, many people from the Commonwealth have been quite upset at the fact that, you know, someone from the European Union can come to the UK, um, no questions asked, 
um, you know, no need for a visa, etc. They may have no connections, and you know, they can come in, etc. Maybe with no, no skills, etc. And some from, say, the Commonwealth, for example, they have they they've got to go through some long process. And so, hold on, their ancestors fought and died in two world wars, etc. And a lot of Commonwealth people felt quite angry about that. But not just that. Some of them just Germany as well don't believe in the EU. It's that simple. And it, it kind of annoyed me a bit that that happened because the idea. The idea that I'm being pigeonholed into a box, and let's be honest, um, no one likes being pigeonholed into a box. They have to have a certain view. So, yeah, it was it was an, it was quite upsetting at points. But I thought, you know what? I'm I'm not a snowflake like some of these people are. I'm going to carry on believing what what I believe, which is that the UK should leave the EU. Call me what you like. You have the free speech to call me an Uncle Tom, a coconut. Do it. But guess what? We voted to leave the EU. I, absolutely, I, I, we did vote to leave the EU. It, it just—it always amuses me the number of middle-class white people that think others are racist, as they say. All black people have to vote the way I tell them. Yeah. And, you know, um, the, the lack of self-awareness is the most astounding thing. Um, it, 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 it's, it, I actually find it funny sometimes because I was having a debate with my um, two two friends on Facebook who both have to be black and. Basically, um, you know, you've had this whole withdrawal deal, and I put up a statement the other day on Facebook saying a Corbyn-led socialist... Oh, sorry, I said Corbyn-led Labour government is not the answer to this issue. And my friend said, well, um, what would be, well then who would be better? I said, let me put it to you this way. Um, just take a headache and a, and, a, and a broken leg. Now, they're both not nice things, OK? Um, but you can at least walk around and do things with a headache, you know, I've gone to, I, you just, I have to still go to work, if I've got a headache, I've still got to look after my family, if I've got a headache, you've got a broken leg, it's a bit hard. I liken Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party to a, a, a broken leg and the Conservatives to a headache. I don't want any of them, but you'd rather have a headache, would you not? And he was like, I can't believe that a black working class guy would, 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 would think the Conservatives are better than, than Labour. And I, and I said, the reason is simply this, the Labour Party will pigeonhole black people, all right? They'll say... You know, it's a selection, you're black, vote for me, you know, we're going to give you this, you know, the Conservatives, you know, they're the racist party, you know, UKIP are racist, you know, the probably, the SMP are racist, probably at Labour's rate, and um, vote for us, vote for us, Democrats in the US, I'm Hillary Clinton, vote for us because you're black, and those Republicans hate hate you because you're black, and they're going to take away your health care too. Um, it, it, being told you've got to think a certain way, no one likes that. No one likes being told that they, they're voting for. No one likes being told because you're black. You've got, you've got to think this way. And one of the reasons why I, I despise Labour is because they run with this so much. It's identity politics. You're black, so you have to vote for us. You know, you got Dawn Butler, you know, moaning at Jamie Oliver because he what, jerk rice. That's cultural probation. I was like, shut up. I was like, shut up, Dawn. Well, kids are getting stabbed in your constituencies every day. Do you not care about that? Mothers are coming home saying my son's in a body bag oh but no Jamie Oliver is culturally appropriated oh, jerk jerk sauce it's very bad and that's one of the reasons why it, it just annoys me and I'm rambling a bit guys I'm sorry but it just, no, it just it beggars belief what they feel like these people have done uh, but, like, <laughs> mate, young black what, what, what are young like mo- most young like and they, and they go on like oh like we have to socially engineer scenarios where people are going to get on because you're black and you're white and you're a Muslim and you're a Jew and it's like, well, hold on. Take a pub on a Friday night. You think people are going to about he's black, he's a Muslim, he's a Jew, he's gay, so I've got to do this. No. Guess what, Labour? People don't give a... They don't care about that. People get on organically regardless of what colour or background they come from. So many people organically have views. Though I'm black. I generally am leaning towards classical liberalism, libertarianism, small state, low taxes. I don't have to support... You know, left-wing socialism. You know, it's about what you believe, not your colour. And Labour will never ever get that. And it's one of the reasons why I just could never vote for their party. And another thing as well. So a lot of black, a lot, a lot of minorities will say you've got to vote Labour because they care about you and your family. Well, guess what? Labour are the party that believe in political correctness, right? You can't say this, you can't say that. So 
as a black person, you can't have an opinion on a certain issue because Labour might say that's offensive and, you know, we're going to get the police to arrest you because you tweeted something unkind. I want every minority to think about that they vote, when they vote for Labour. I, it, it, yeah, I, 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 it's incredibly... And, and it's that freedom that I want to sort of touch on. So we mentioned already that you're a, a libertarian. Well, and, well, I, 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 well, or a member of the Libertarian yeah, Party. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of don't like giving myself labels, but let's... But, but, I, but I guess I lean towards that sort of politics. So, yeah, so yeah. We, we, we bumped into you, Dan and I, at the Libertarian Party conference yeah. in London earlier this year. Um, so I asked Dan, first of all, uh, what were your thoughts of the party conference uh, that we went to? And, and just, we're, neither of us are actually members of that party, but we thought, uh, it, the, the party conference, the Libertarian, I'll just quickly give my thought, the Libertarian Party conference was very much partly round the idea that we're asked some questions and we go down the pub. So that, that enticed mm. me to go. Dan, what were your thoughts? And then, Reese, I'd like to ask you a bit about your thoughts on it. Well, um, I came across the event, uh, probably on the internet, and noticed that it was uh, very reasonably priced, uh, very convenient to get to, and it had a chap whose name escapes me who'd set up his own country called Lieberland. Uh, so I thought, this will be an interesting way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, my impression of the conference overall, and this, was, this is going back a very uh, early part of, uh, of this year, was there was a lot of uh, well-meaning ideas that I could very easily get on board with, uh, libertarian ideas. Uh, my concern with the party at that point was that there didn't seem to be a plan for how you would get councillors and then in due course MPs Um, indeed it it struck me that there was a feeling um, from the stage that because of the electoral system um, it was very difficult for small parties to to gain a foothold which is true Mm -hmm. and sort of the suggestion was well don't bother Whereas that, that clearly can't be the case for any political party of any of any persuasion, you do need to actually start off in, in little areas, build up support, and it, sometimes it takes time, and sometimes it, it takes a while. You get a bit of a base, and then you get a bit of a snowball effect, and all of a sudden you've got lots of councillors and maybe one or two MPs. Certainly, that's how the um, the Liberal Democrats, as they came back in the in the 90s, mm. that's how that's how they went about doing it with these sort of cluster of of councillors in certain areas, and that they then got MPs. There didn't seem to be um, that sort of a, a mindset going on. Now, that was um, in the very early part of the year. I believe there's been a subsequent conference of some description in Milton Keynes not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. And what was interesting at that, I think the, the thing which made it slightly famous, was, of course, that uh, Bill Etheridge, who had been a UKIP MEP for some time, um, he'd obviously fallen out with the, the current leadership of UKIP, resigned from UKIP a couple of days before that, and was speaking at the Libertarian Party conference anyway, and, and he, uh, he announced that he had joined the Libertarian Party. So that's an interesting move. Um, what, what, what do you think about uh, about Bill joining the party and, and the way the party might be able to develop over the, the coming years? I was so excited when he joined. I, li- I kind of sort of gathered it because we had a Libertarian meet-up a couple of weeks beforehand, and um, I'd see... I, I'd, you know, for, you know, Facebook such a giveaway. I, I noticed a few, a few inklings. So one of the former leaders, Andrew Withers, I noticed he'd been to Brussels a lot. I thought he was just there for work because he travels around a lot for um, for what he does. But he was actually there um, speaking to um, um, Bill Everidge, and I think it was someone else, um, the Earl of Dartmouth. What's what's his name? Um, oh, don't know that one. No, he's 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 he, well, he's William, William Dartmouth. Yeah, William. So yeah, so William Dartmouth. Sorry, William Dartmouth. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, He's recently been promoted. Yeah, oh, okay, cool, yeah. Um, he was talking to them. I was thinking, hmm. Andrew said to me um, at the pub, there's going to be um, a lot of movement happening at the, um, at the um, conference in Milton Keynes, which I went to. It was great. He said, keep your eyes peeled. I was like, hmm. He's speaking to Bill Average and um, William on, 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 in, in Brussels. He's taking photos of him. I sniff a defection. It's like, oh, I sniff a defection. I'm si- I, I sniff something. And, and yeah, I thought it was great because we get more coverage. And well, fair, fair enough, it's only for six months we're going to have him. but who knows, you know, we don't know, he might be in endless transition, he might have all oh, the extenders, it could be, so like, we'll, we'll come on to that later, but so I think it's very good because more, more, it will give more of a platform for the um, party, but going back to what um, you were saying, um, Dan, uh, like, it's, it's just so hard for, for us to, to get a foothold in the first past the post, and like, I, I get you, we, should, we shouldn't have the, have the idea that, oh, just give up, but it's just, 
Yeah, you could know what it's like starting from the ground up. It's so hard to start from the ground up as a party. Yep. Like you've got everything. You've got the media at you. You've got people saying you're unprofessional, you're incompetent. You've got just the fact that people don't know what you stand for. Someone said to us once, oh, are you the Liberal, Liberal Democrats? You're like, <laughs> definitely not the Liberal Democrats. Yeah. Um, we, we actually believe, we're actually Liberal and Democratic, kind of like that party, but that's a different story. Um, so, yeah, it's, this will get us more coverage, hopefully. Um, but we've just got to build it up from here, so... Uh, and Bill is a yeah. Bill is a seasoned campaigner. He's got a big following. Um, he he is a kind of a big personality. He's, Very he's, big. He's yeah. uh, media experience, and it's all those things that no doubt you've got good people, yeah. but will, who don't necessarily have that experience and mm. background and list of contacts. People will phone Bill up to get an answer, to get a question out of him, and and that now has a libertarian brand on it, which is mm. a huge step forward. Mm. You just mentioned with UKIP, um, for although this kind of podcast is cross party, I, I, I've stood for UKIP and I stood in Labour in, in New Addington not long ago, and the Labour candidate came up and asked me something. I said, "Well, you know, we, we, we're having a bit of a downtime as a party," and I said, uh, "Well, you might have heard it was on the press. We've not we've not been doing so well." Uh, and he says, "So, uh, so who funds all these events? Are you self funded?" As if this was kind of a crazy notion. The leaflets that, you know, the, the stall we were standing on, I think Dan had probably brought. Mm. The leaflets that we were handing out, I brought. Uh, and, and that would be absolutely true of the Libertarian Party. Small parties, self people are self-funding, mm. they're working hard on it. And anything that gives you an edge and a bit of a, a difference is, is, is really critical. Mm. Just going back to, um, um, going back, going back to um, Bill Leatheridge, um, one thing that's good about him is he's very active on social media too. He's very responsive um, and... He has a lot of videos that he puts up of himself at the European Parliament. So the fact that he to have someone like him on board, like I said, he's got a very big personality and he's got a very big following. And I think that's going to just do really good for the Libertarian Party. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Really. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, absolutely he's got that social media following mm. and, and presence. Um, and yes, he is an MEP for now. Um, I very much hope that he's no longer MEP by the end of March. Not just him, yeah. but obviously everybody. Yeah. I hope there's no uh, British MEPs by no March. British MEPs yeah. by, the, by, that, yeah, by yeah. that point. Uh, but I think, uh, I mean, I've campaigned with Bill previously, mm. um, and he, he certainly knows what he's doing. And I think, that whilst in the short term his media presence is very useful to the Libertarian, mm. Party, kind of Libertarian Party, I think actually having him on board and involved in the, the management of the party, if you like, would be very useful in terms of developing mm. a campaigning strategy. And yes, it may have to start small, but I think the impression I got was that was what was missing. Some very mm. good ideas, some, some very good you know, policy, policy uh, concepts, but it was that how do you run a campaign successfully at a grassroots level? And, you know, we can do what you want on social media, but at that grassroots level... And, and it could well be that he um, he helps the party to to, to to actually you know get some councillors somewhere and, and, and sort of move forward. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, that, I think um, his he has he has got like, he's got the experience of being an MEP, campaigning, going out on the doorstep more so than we have had as a Libertarian Party. So the things that we may have been getting wrong, he can say no. This is what you've got to do. This is how you do it. And. I think some good things for us maybe coming up in the, um, in the upcoming council election. I think we might, we're going to notice a big load of people noticing the Libertarian Party. So watch this space for the next um, local elections. That's all I can say. Uh, just on that, I think uh, if you get candidates out mm. and you start getting your message out, in the same way that worked for UKIP, before people were elected, uh, the message gets... Uh, traction and makes change and, and if all the other parties start seeing, it happened with the Green Party before mm. that uh, and I don't necessarily agree with Green politics but but you know the the big parties became more environment, environmentally friendly when, when the Green Party came on the scene, the big parties became more Eurosceptic when UKIP came on the scene and you never know they might become more libertarian when the Libertarian Party comes on the scene um, so I just but no party gets everything they want, and and, and obviously the, the Libertarian Party has a, a particular stance, and and it's it's very different, unfortunately, from where we are today as a nation. So let's assume Brexit happens. It's a big assumption, but let's go with it mm. for the moment. I just just to give people a bit of a flavour of what the Libertarian Party are and what perhaps you believe in. If there was say a top three things that would happen. Uh, if they, they were elected, or that could happen, three things you could change in this country, new laws, repealed laws, change the way we're governed, what, what might they be? 
Well, um, I'll just explain um, three of the key um, policies of the Libertarian Party. So one of those is a, um, a written constitution, a Swiss style constitu- constitution. Um, they believe that our current setup in the UK, we believe our current setup in the UK isn't conducive to um, where we are now. You know, we're in a situation now where the UK is becoming more federal. We're in a situation now where the government has no limits. So libertarian politics, you know, cut, to, to give a bit of a brief overview, is just it believes in small government, individual freedom, individual sh- and businesses should be able to do what they want as long as they don't harm others. Um, so one of our main policies is obviously to start our constitution. The second thing is pretty much just limiting the role of government in our lives in many areas, whether it's things such as the different as I mentioned before, political correctness, all the speech codes that we have, um, whether it comes to things such as governments trying to regulate our, our habits, our lifestyles, you know, how much you can drink, that sort of stuff. Um, another policy that um, will um, probably um, come on board from the Libertarian Party is also um, the um, decriminalisation um, um, of drugs. That's one policy. I know not everyone agrees that that is one of our policies. That's just the policy that we have. So that, that's one thing that will change. One of our other policies... Um, um, is actually um, to reduce um, reduce taxes. So we want to um, increase the um, threshold of um, to um, twenty thousand, twenty five thousand, um, um, and from that starting rate, it's going to be ten percent. So that's going to be happening. You're going to notice a lot of people paying less tax, a lot more individual freedom, and actually a constitution in the country which says these are the limits of government. This is what government can do. This is what it can't do. That's what's going to change about this country. And I think that's that's what we need. For me, Brexit wasn't just about oh leaving the EU, it was about reducing the role of government in our lives overall in this country and that's the message that we've got to push out for the next till the next election and hopefully we get traction Have I answered your question? I, don't, I think I might have no, grabbed a bit I, but, I, think yeah. I, I was born free, let me live free Exactly, and like, like, libertarianism is basically just, you know, live your life how you choose, don't harm anyone else and that's what I want Britain to be about, you know. You may agree with me, you may not, that's fine. You live your life, I live my life. and that, that, That's what you want in our, in, our, in, our, in our country, post-Brexit. I think that's, you know, whatever party you end up voting for in, uh, in future elections, I think, you know, that's something that certainly the Croydon Constitutionalists are very much in favour of. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the EU was a... Or still is a a transnational government mm. that is telling you what to do. Whereas you know, as, as a classical liberal, I, I believe certainly that the individual is sovereign. Mm. And yes, you know, we can we can give up some some sovereignty over things. You know, like I, I don't particularly want my own private army. Don't know. Some days I wonder about it. <laughs> but, but generally, we don't want such things. So we have a nation. But mm. you know, and you can only have democracy when you have a demos, and that's when mm. people broadly agree with the same thing and, and in the United Kingdom notwithstanding the alleged divisions we, we do have that you know you don't have that within the European Union because it, it's so diverse both culturally language if you can't speak to somebody if you can't communicate with them how, how, how is that going to work for you that's going to be very difficult um, and yeah, so the individual is the, is the, the key component in all of this, and that the, the, the limit of government, as far as I'm concerned, should be you know, the lowest level possible to actually achieve, achieve the result. Mm. Um, and the EU has gone beyond that in a, in a way that is completely unnecessary. And, hey, if Germany and France wanted to get together, fine. If that stops them from fighting with each other, then those people believe in that, fine. Mm. The United Kingdom never believed in that, didn't need to believe in that, has a fundamentally different legal system, and the two don't mix, and that's ultimately why you why you get Brexit, because we're we're a freedom loving people. Absolutely. No, oh, well, uh, yes. So so that's the sort of and leave me alone politics. I think from all of us there, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 yeah, it's it's. I I, you don't get to tell me what to do in my own space, and mm. and I think uh, whether it's a libertarian party or any party that's got that kind of libertarian view or that liberal classically liberal view uh, uh, need to be all pushing on a common mm. platform of do less try and do less and do it well not do more and do well, it badly that was, that was meant to be the tories but unfortunately um you know they've they've basically gone into sort of big government sort of uh, you know the tories are always the party which now, you know, whether you like them or not, you could always trust them to sort of limit the role of government, well, at least economically, maybe not necessarily socially, but now it's just so they're just as, as, bad, as bad as Labour, really. I mean, you know, they, they, 
they don't believe in small government anymore. And, and I think Welby can really put pressure on the on the parties really by the way you could put pressure on them when it came to the referendum. We took pressure in terms of their big government policies. Why do you want to do things like um, have regulations against fixed or bedding bed terminals? Why do you want to do things like um, clamp down on tobacco? Why do you want to do, thi- do, do things like um, stop uh, you know, all these laws against drinking? Those sorts of things. That's where we can really put pressure on the Tories, and maybe that's how the Libertarian Party can get its name out. Freedom is the freedom to make bad choices. Absolutely. And I'll drink to that. <laughs> Indeed. Rhys, thank you ever so much for speaking to us today. And uh, no Thank doubt you. we're keeping touch. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it was great to uh, great to catch up with with Reese for that uh, that interview there, uh, and it's it's great to hear from a lad who isn't encumbered by his his background into believing that he, you know he has to believe in in certain things because uh, that's what the media tell him. You know he, he believes very much in Brexit and is is you know staunchly in favour of of uh, individual liberty. And, and this, you know, Reese's uh, uh, politics are, are kind of on an edge of the spectrum to some extent because they're, uh, it, it's a very much a, a, a freedom view. The thing I, I find great and engaging about them, apart from the fact that, you know, as a young lad, he's very much engaged in it, he, he certainly helps us out, is that his politics just want to leave you alone. That's fan. You know, if you don't like them, guess what? Worst case scenario, they just leave you alone. I, I find that much, much more preferable to someone's politics who, if you don't like them, they're going to come and impose on you. And that's, that's a, a yeah, great, great credit to it. Indeed. Uh, so, uh, finally, uh, this, uh, for this podcast, we've got some upcoming events of uh, Brexit nature locally. Uh, firstly, very locally, indeed local being the operative word for, uh, for myself, uh, on Friday the 7th of December at 2.30pm, uh, Tim Martin, the chairman and founder of the Weatherspoons pub range, uh, will be in one of his pubs, the Skylark, in South Croydon. And he, will be, he regularly goes to, to, to his pubs to, to talk with customers, but he's specifically going there uh, this coming Friday to talk to customers about Brexit and how we would be better off leaving at the end of March uh, with no deal, especially compared to the deal that's been offered. Uh, so if you are available uh, on Friday the 7th of December in the afternoon, do please pop along to the Skylark uh, and have a word with, uh, have a word with Tim. Um, another event that's coming up, which is not quite so local, but in central London, uh, the following Friday, uh, that's Friday the 14th of December at 6.45pm in Westminster, is a Leave Means Leave rally. Uh, that I believe speaking at that will be Nigel Farage, there'll be uh, Tim as well, uh, Kate Howey, uh, the, the Labour Party uh, Member of Parliament for um, Vauxhall, so another local, uh, locally MP, and Sammy Wilson from the, from the DUP. So that could be a good event to, uh, to go along to. Um, Mike, what do you think about these events being taking place extremely locally? Well, extremely locally, it's fantastic that... Uh... Tim uh, is coming down to the Skylark. Um, <clears throat> good to get some more Brexit activity in Croydon. Um, really looking forward to that. Uh, the the Leave Means Leave Valley in London. This is again is part of their their nationwide tour. I believe that will be streamed on various social media. So uh, try and get along if you can't. Well worth uh, picking up a video for. Excellent. Definitely, yes. Definitely, two events worth uh, worth supporting, worth viewing. Uh, however, you could you can get involved if if you can, or if you can't, uh, do uh, do stick to social media to see what uh, how how it goes. Um, so here at the podcast, we do like to uh, be in contact with our, with our listeners. So do please get in contact if you've got any questions, or you'd you'd like to you'd like to be interviewed, perhaps. Um, if you've got some uh, some things to discuss, we, obviously we've had we've had Reese on today's podcast, and previously we've had. Uh, Phil Shepherd, uh, always happy to, uh, to to have a chat. Uh, we can be contacted on the Twitter at Croydon Const uh, via our Facebook page. You can go to our website at croydonconstitutionalists.uk or you can email us at croydonconstitutionalists at gmail.com. Uh, so we'll be uh, having a podcast in due course, so do please uh, subscribe to that. Uh, do please go along or uh, take part or or view the the upcoming events that we've discussed and do please get in touch Uh, but until next time it's goodbye from me
That's goodbye from me. Goodbye.